Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. From the Americans to Outcast to Boardwalk Empire, Renchmit has become a staple of great TV drama. Starting this week, you can see her in The Looming Tower on Hulu, which tells the story of the rise of Al-Qaeda and the road to 9-11. Let's take a look. No. Richard. We do not have an unequivocal MON from the president. Until we do, the answer is no. In that case, we should revisit the Tarnak operation we were advocating last year. Which is? We incentivize Pashtun tribesmen. Cash payments, essentially. The ones who are in and out of Al-Qaeda encampments all the time to kidnap UBL from his main camp at Tarnak Farms. They stash him in a safe house in one of their villages. After several days when- When things calm down. We rendition him anywhere we like. Egypt, perhaps. Where they have, shall we say, more latitude in terms of interrogation techniques. If he dies in custody under Mubarak, the blood's not on our hands. And if he dies in Afghanistan, resisting the kidnapping, we haven't violated the terms of the MON. You don't even know where Bin Laden is, Martin. How can you kidnap him when you can't find him? Everybody, please welcome Wrench Man. Let's hear it. Thank you. Hey there. Hi. She's she's a real sweetheart, can't you tell? Yeah. I mean, the, the, there's a lot to unpack in that scene, given the time that it takes place and what happened with those laws and America's relationship to it after 9-11, <laughs> when it came to rendition and it became to... Right. Yeah. Uh, but first things first, uh, every scene of this show is an incredible actor. Every, True. Every person cast, Bill Camp, Peter Sarsgaard, Michael Stuhlbarg in that scene, Jeff Daniels. What, what was it like to go to work every day? Um, I was just trying to keep up. I mean, you do? You do very well. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it's kind of a dream job in a way. Um, I feel lucky that I've had a few of those. Yeah. Um, but on this one, the the writing is extraordinary. The cast is exquisite. Um, and it's really fun to go to work uh, every day when you know that you're telling a story that's deeply important. We'll talk about your character. So I play Diane Marsh, um, maybe one of the most terrifying people in the room, always. <laughs> Um, she's somebody that's always thinking five steps ahead, uh, and I tend to find those people really scary. Same. Uh, yeah. The type of people who wait for you to talk. Yeah, yeah, she does know? that. <laughs> and, then, and then you start talking, and then they don't start, and then you just start telling them personal details about yourself? Because yeah. Because you're like, I'm lost, I don't know, why aren't you talking to me? Yeah, well, I feel like what those people do is they kind of look at you, and they yeah. wait, and then they nod, like, continue. And you go, fuck, you're so much smarter than me. And then they keep looking at you. I'm about to start talking right, about yeah. my life. <laughs> yeah, so um, she's an analyst at uh, the CIA's Alex Station. She works under Martin Schmidt, um, who is kind of her mentor. Um, she's definitely probably the most ambitious analyst at Alex Station. Um, and she's deeply devoted to her job, which is hunting down bin Laden. Real person, right? She's a composite She's character. She's a composite character, okay. Yeah, so she um, and Martin Schmidt, Sh Martin Schmidt, excuse me, both. You'd think I'd know how to say that name, right? Given that I'm Ren Schmidt. Um, they're both composite characters that are representative of different strains of thought within Alex Station at that time. Did you meet with any analysts uh, before shooting the show? Did you, did you look into sort of what the personality is generally like when it comes to these kind of CIA analysts? Well, I feel like that for me is tricky because I feel like you can get an idea from that, but that's not necessarily going to always line up with the writing. So I feel like for me, the writing is where I start. Um, like, like you said, like, when does that person talk? When do they choose not to talk? Which can be just as important. Um, what do they actually do? How do they behave? Um, but as far as research goes, um, I spoke with a former field officer who'd been in the CIA for 25 years. Um, so she was sworn in the day that Reagan was sworn in, or I guess she started that day. I don't know if you swear in as a CIA officer. And then she worked overseas for 25 years and at one point came back and was at Alex Station. So she was a great resource as far as kind of understanding the culture of the CIA um, and understanding kind of like how the CIA functions within the government. Um, the, CIA is, the CIA's biggest client is the President of the United States. So that was huge for me, and I feel like that kind of plays out in this scene a little bit as far as getting permission to move forward with something. Did you get a chance to ask her uh, how she felt about the president's current war with the CIA that is being waged? I didn't, because at the time that wasn't really uh, an issue. Um, so no, 
but I think that if you work within the CIA for that long, you tend to have strong viewpoints. Yeah. And she did. Yeah. So how did the script come to you? Um, it was pretty generic for me as an actor. It was an audition. Um, and my manager was like, you've got to audition for this show called The Looming Tower. And I immediately geeked out because I already knew Larry's book and was like, yes, when, where, tell me everything. Um, but I actually feel like I was a little lucky that I didn't understand um, exactly who this character was. So I just went into the audition and played the scenes. I think had I known, there would have been a lot of pressure. Um, so it was kind of Why like... Why is that? What do you mean? Well, because I think you feel like rather than it... Um, rather than just going in and doing the scene, it's a little bit like um, overthinking a jump. You know, like if you're like, I always think of show ponies. I don't know why, it's so weird. You know, them like going through like a course and like a big jump coming up and you overthink that and then you, you might stumble. So I feel like it's, it's better just to go in and do your thing and think about it later. Did you ever ride ponies? I've never ridden a pony. <laughs> I have no idea why show ponies come into my mind. Um, I also tend to not look up directors if I don't know who they are already. Oh, really? Yeah, I, when I walked into my outcast um, test with Robert Kirkman. And Adam Wingard, right? Well, yeah, he ended up doing didn't the pilot. really understand how, what a big deal both of those people were. I was just like, hey, dudes, what's going on? Which scene are we doing first? And he was like, he was like, you don't know who I. No, he's Robert like, I'm Kirkman the creator is of the, like uh, the most, most unassuming <laughs> cable cable show right on right now. Right, right. No, he's like the most unassuming, sweet, funny guy. So I think he was fine with that. He wasn't expecting me to bow. I'll cast a, a wonderful pilot. I mean, it's a great show, but that pilot, I thought that pilot was one of the sort of great horror show pilots and TV pilots I'd seen in some time. Agreed. That opening sequence with the kid smashing his head against the wall. Gabriel Bateman, remember his name. I feel like he's going to be a huge deal. What's yeah. that? Um, I think he's, I think at the time, actually I shouldn't say, I don't know how old he was at the time, but he was amazing. I mean, incredible, even at the table read. It was, I mean, I felt like he was putting the rest of us who have been doing this for a while to shame because he just brought it. And he brought it every day on set. And I feel like it shows in his performance. How old were you when you started acting? I was about three in my parents' living room. Um, there was some, uh, I think, Whitney Houston on. And I had on, like, a powder blue leotard and tights. Um, and, like, a jump. You know those running trampolines? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did, like, a lot of routines on that um, trampoline for my mom and dad and my sister. Um, but professionally, uh, I started in Columbia, South Carolina when I was about 14, 15, and then went away to a boarding school called the Governor's School. Um, and then well, you started professionally acting when you were 14, 15? Well, or do you I mean, mean we like had, you were doing school plays? Kind there's of a thing? professional theater in South Carolina called Trustus Theater, yeah. and I was an apprentice there, and I basically would do any job they would let me do. So I was like, stage manage, you got it. Soundboard, definitely. Um, and then I eventually got to do my first straight play, which um, was a really light play called Free Will and Wanton Lust by Nikki Silver. <laughs> so when you're 16 and your parents are watching you make out with somebody 10 years older than you, my parents were definitely like, yeah, this is a great career for you. Yeah, I was just thinking they're watching this going, God, she's going to be an actress. Uh, I know, We're right? going to have to deal with this. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think they were a little confused, but they've been very supportive. Really? So what was your first big role after school? Or what was your, do you call it, I don't know if you call it a breakthrough role, but your first role, you're like, oh, wow, I'm a paid actor now. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I've had a, a breakthrough role. I mean, I feel like when you have that moment, that's incredible as an actor, but I also feel like when you have an opportunity to work steady, steadily without kind of like the, the bright lights and heat of being like the new thing, um, it's kind of nice because right. you that's just, kind of the breakthrough. It's like, oh, there's another thing for me to do now and another thing for me to do and I get to work. Yeah. Well, I mean, and that you just said the magic word. For me, I always felt like I want to be a working actor. If I can be a working actor, then I'll uh, be satisfied with that, um, whatever that looks like. Was Boardwalk really your first kind of like uh, foray into acting with like a lot of other sort of big names and people that have been, had been doing it for quite some time? So my first kind of like big job where I got my equity card was understudying on the national tour of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf with wow. Kathleen Turner and Bill Irwin. Whoa. Yeah, so that was kind of my first moment of like, oh my God, that's Kathleen Turner. Don't look, don't look. Don't look her in the eye. <laughs> um, you were playing Sandy Dennis's 
part, I would imagine, or understudying? I was understudying, honey, yeah. So it was kind of fabulous because um, they rehearsed that play again before they went on tour, and I got to be in the room for that, so... Did that you was ever get to perform it? I did not. It's um, a tough role. I, was, I actually watched that movie just the other night, and uh, that's a, Honey's role is really tough. Yeah. Acting drunk like that for the majority of a movie and being believable or for the part on stage. Right. Yeah, but that's really fun. I've done that in a play, and it's um, an amazing amount of fun. Really? Yeah. I imagine that's, being, that's such a fine line between being realistic and then going, going too, far. too far. You usually have to choose one thing. So it can't be that like you slur your words and you can't walk oh. and you fall down. It's like, well, I'm just a person who slurs my words when I'm really drunk. So if I slur my words, everything else kind of has to stay. Yeah, normal. you can't do it all. You can't. It can't be like a buffet of different things. You just <laughs> have to like choose one. Right. As soon as you do more than one, the audience goes, "Oh God, here we go." Yeah, because most of the time, drunk people are definitely trying to not appear drunk. You yeah. know, it's like, I just got to get the key in this. I just I'm going to get it in that lock. I'm going to get it in that hole right there. <laughs> so, I'm drive this car. Focus. I'm going to drive this focus. car. Focus. Yeah, exactly. I got I got this. I'm going to stay on this side of the yellow line. Yeah. So what was it like when you got when you got Boardwalk? Um, That was also an amazing moment because I feel like I didn't really expect to get that job. I didn't quite understand what that role would be. So it felt to me like, okay, you're going to go into this room and do this scene, and then they're going to pick the person that they feel like has the best chemistry with Jack Houston. So I think everybody who's here at this callback is probably a great actor, and then it, the rest is kind of out of your hands. Um, but that was an incredible job. I mean, talk about walking into the most enormous, beautifully done production. Um, I mean, I was just kind of in awe the whole time. And getting to work with Jack... I mean, he, I don't know who here has seen that show, but he was my favorite character on that show. Jack Houston was playing the... Hero, yeah. yeah. So it was pretty much... I'd been watching that show, so to get to work with him, you know, in that storyline was kind of... Um, I don't know. It felt like I was walking on air. I had a friend who extraed on that show, not because they wanted to be an actor or wanted to extra, they just had some time off of work. And I was like, why are you going to be an extra on the He said, no, the sets are beautiful. They are. I just, I just like getting dressed up. I have to say, one of my favorite things about that job was learning how to drive a Model T. Oh, wow. I was so into that. It was like my brain just like went nuts. It was Is like it hard. It's extraordinarily hard. Oh, wow. The brake and the uh, gas they're reversed, and like the stick is over here. Uh, I actually one day almost hit Jack with the car. <laughs> <laughs> um, not maybe my best moment, but it was at the end of, I think, like a 16 or 17 hour day. And I couldn't feel my feet anymore because we'd been, it's the, it's the scene where they're at the dance hall. So I could not feel my feet. And they were like, okay, quick, quick, quick. We're going to lose the light. You got to like get in the car and um, you're going to drive up to this mark and look out the window. And then you're going to continue on and park the car here. And I hadn't driven the car for like a month and a half. So I was like, okay, roger that. Got it. Um, and then as I was driving towards him... How do I drive the car again? Right. Well, as I was driving towards him, like, habit kicked in, and I hit the brake instead of the gas because they're reversed. And you could just see him as I was coming towards him, like, oh, my God, do I move? Do I jump? Do I jump? I did not hit him, just for the record. So now you, uh, you get on Looming Tower. Um, obviously... All the writing is going to come from the writer's room and the creators of the show, and you got your directors. But do you go back and read Lawrence Wright's book? Um, is that Yes. Yeah. How familiar do you want to be with the source material before you get in there, even though all your lines are going to be kind of you know, written for you? Well, I mean, I think when you're trying to put yourself into a job or situation that you don't really have context for, um, I don't know about you guys, but I have almost no context for what it's actually like to work at the CIA. Um, I feel like nobody does unless you work at the CIA. Um, for me, it was really important once I familiarized myself with our story to feel like I understood enough about um, current events at that time and the history kind of of what was going on in Afghanistan um, and in that whole region so that I could speak words like you guys saw in that scene and not feel like a complete fraud. You know, I wanted to feel like I could talk about um, what's happening in our story the way that I talk about acting, you know, that just to have some of that information at my fingertips. So for me, it was really important to read Larry's book again, to um, read Steve Call's book called Ghost Wars, which is extraordinary as well, 
and to speak with this field officer. And then once you kind of feel like you've got like enough of that stuff marinating, you just let it go and go back to the script. Right. You can get on, you can get on set and you can say the lines without not knowing exactly what they mean and feeling silly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you feel like you've got some authority. Like doing Shakespeare takes a, uh, an absurd amount of re research sometimes totally. because you need to feel comfortable saying all of this yeah, sort of it proposed needs to feel language. Like second, you know, like second nature. Yeah, and that that ended up coming kind of easy after reading this material. Um, yeah, do you I mean, still ask a lot of questions on set, or do you try to sort of get yourself to a place where you kind of don't have to ask questions? Yes, I try to become a complete expert. Well, no, no, guys, I've got this. Um, no, actually, I feel like one of the things that was really important was to ask questions because our story, while we stay true to events, it's still dramatized. Mm -hmm. So something that might have happened over the course of three weeks might happen in a scene that's a page and a half. So like the writing team is is kind of trying to address all of that um, that like journey or arc for what was ha actually happening in a very short amount of time. So. I'd have to kind of be like, wait a minute, does this refer to this? And how does this connect to this? And and then I would kind of be able to put it together. But this scene was pretty straightforward. Acting is such a, a strange beast because it's one of those things where if you have never done it, if you never directed someone, you don't understand the idea. It just, no matter what, it looks like someone just gets there and says the lines. But this element of having to feel comfortable with the lines that you're saying, otherwise it's completely embarrassing and vulnerable. It's such a, you know, that's where all these questions come from, right? Well, I think maybe yes and no. Um, I feel like there, are, well, I feel like there are other shows like for, Out, for Outcast, for instance, just as an example, or Boardwalk. Those scenes to me felt, um, very uh, tangible. Like I could kind of immediately wrap my head around those relationships and like what those characters were experiencing. Experiencing, um, And in this show, it felt like there's just so much to kind of chew on as far as like what these people know and what they're talking about, that it was really important to actually do a ton of research. So I feel like that changes from job to job. And like I was here at AOL Bill doing um, a chat about the good Catholic and again, like that character felt so um, like part of like a different fabric within me that it was just very accessible. So all of that came very easily. This was, this is maybe one of the hardest jobs I've ever done. It was really a, a cool challenge. Is that because of the dyna the dynamics of the scenes of the good Catholic and, and, and Boardwalk and Outcast feel immediately relatable versus something where you, like, like we said before, you're using language that is not common to your everyday life? Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that's true, but I also think that with this show, given what our story is about, you also feel like a certain degree of responsibility to try and do it some kind of justice. So I think there's that, but also, again, like it just, it felt like it, I needed to do like a deep dive to have an understanding where I could walk onto set and not feel like a bozo, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I don't know if bozo is the right word, but just to feel like I could step into those shoes confidently and, and kind of inhabit that character without being self-conscious. Like that's maybe the more serious answer. I do like the word bozo though. Bozo is a good word. I like the idea of imagining <laughs> you as a bozo trying to say these lines inside the. Uh, no, I just I don't know. I'm gonna pull him out of <laughs> Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. Like. Hey guys, um, I've got a great idea. We're gonna just go after these camps. It'll be cool. No one's gonna mind, and uh, we'll be set with Ben Laden. Right, just improvise your way around this dialogue right. here. Yeah, right. Could you even imagine? Oh my God, I'd be like falling off the highest tightrope <laughs> and just crashing and burning. Uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who has questions? You. Hi. Hi. Um, so uh, I was an extra on the on the show when it was called Forty North, I guess. Um, and uh, I know it was shot around New York. Uh, how much uh, attention did you notice went into the, making the scenes or some of the locations authentic to that time period and um, and even like the characters? Um, yeah, more realistic. Um, I think I think it was kind of the same level as something like Boardwalk. Um, it's just that it feels more familiar if you've lived through the 90s. Um, I really loved kind of seeing what our costumes were going to be like and like some 90s hair. Uh, some of the FBI agents have some really cool hairstyles going on. Um, 
but I, I feel like we had like an amazing production team that was top notch. So all of those folks are the best of the best. And I feel like it shows, um, in our sets and our costumes, um, you know, hair and makeup, um, as well as the locations that were chosen. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody here, <laughs> I'm not sure if there were any people that got up uh, this morning bright and early and watched all three of the first episodes. But I'll, um, also we have um, overseas locations and I feel like there was a lot of care that went into selecting those. And now Gibney well. directed the first episode or? or yes. Yeah, what was it like working with Alex Gibney, primarily a, a, a documentary filmmaker? So what's cool about that question is I've actually worked with Alex before. Um, oh, right, client number, client, client nine. nine. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So for me, actually, that was another big draw for the project was that Alex was involved. And I was like, sign me up. Well, first, can I have that part? And then sign me up. Um, so it was great. I mean, I think he brings a lot to the show um, as far as like what his special skill set is um, in telling a story. And I feel like it's such a great element how he's um, like interwoven into each episode, um, you know, as part of the collaborative process, like actual footage, you know, like there's footage of, I think like what was going on with Monica Lewinsky at the time, which was a huge deal. I mean, talk about I like- love the footage of like Ann Curry's. Oh yeah, show, right? Yeah. Like blast from the past, uh, stuff like that. It's, it's also the thing that it feels, the way that they're talking about it is the way that anchors talk about what's happening right now with the president in terms of lying under oath or being investigated and, and uh, the special counsel. But it's, in hindsight, it's so much less serious <laughs> than like what we're talking about right now. Yes, but I think like the connection there is like scandal yes. and how kind of scandal seems to be like what's pervasive in the media as far as like what the coverage is and what people seem to be hungry for versus like the nuts and bolts of, you know, what's really going on. Absolutely. That's why, you know, you can turn on CNN and hear the same thing about the Russia story over and over again, right. but not hear something about uh, inter international news that's happening that is actually having like a weird reverberation across the whole globe. Right, right, right. Um, in client number nine, remind me, who did you who did you play in client number nine in the recreation? Oh, well, there was um, just the, the one part, which was Angelina, the woman that um, did repeatedly see Elliot Spitzer. So Alex interviewed the real person, um, but she didn't want to have her likeness at all represented in the film. So he took her whole transcript and then hired me to portray her. And then he interviewed me like he did when he met her. So that's kind of um, how we did it. We did it all in one morning, which was terrifying. I think it was like 12 pages, basically like a 12 page monologue to memorize over a weekend. And also like not having a context for anything about her other than what he was telling me, so. That's kind of a cool job, though. Yeah, it's a little bit like jumping off of a high dive and being like, I know there's something down there that I'm going to fall into, but I don't know what it is. Is that kind of every day of going to a film set? Um, well, I think that one in particular, because I'd never done anything like that before. Um, and I also felt like, I know she's going to watch this. Right. I know she's going to watch it, and I hope that she doesn't hate what she sees. Did you find out if she watched it and what she thought of it? I don't remember. I honestly don't remember. Uh, next question. Hi there. Hi. Um, as we talked about earlier, uh, you made your start on the stage, um, but you went to TV and film. Do you have any plans on returning to the stage, or do you want to stick with TV and film? I would love to. Which camera do I say? I would love to. <laughs> um, here, I would love to. Um, I feel like I've been so lucky to work in TV and film, um, and it's kind of been like, how with my schedule do I also find a play that slots in in between production? Um, but I would love to. I would love to. <laughs> Is there a play in your back pocket that you've always wanted to do, a favorite play, that favorite part that you've always wanted to do? That's a really good question. Um, there is an Irish playwright named Marina Carr who uh, wrote By the Bog of Cats um, and another play called Portia Coughlin. Um, I would love to do either of those. Um, so those are, those are plays that intrigue me, um, but I don't know. Great poll. I love that your poll was something a little, like a, a little bit esoteric. Well, I read those, so I studied abroad when I was in college at Trinity College, and so I got to read like a ton of just amazing 
I mean, the Irish canon. I'm going to get really geeky on you now. Please. There's just so many great plays um, that came out of that country in the last century and continue to. If anybody here is a Martin McDonough fan, raise your hand. Hangman. <clears throat> I am. Same. I'm ready, Martin. Whenever you're ready, I'm ready. Have, um, you, seen, have you seen Hangman yet? I have not seen Hangman yet. I've um, been a little bit on a sprint for this um, show for the last few weeks. Um, you don't need to justify. My, guys, I haven't had time, okay? Um, no, I would I would love to do a play. Uh, I feel like he's one, Brian Friel, uh, maybe one of the greatest playwrights um, from Ireland. Um, he's incredible. Um, who else? I love Sam Shepard. I feel like um, Fool for Love, which was just done recently, so that's probably not an option. Um, uh, that was the first play that I saw that made me feel like I want to definitely be an actor. Not like a running around my parents' house wearing like some silly leotard, but I want to do that. I want to do what that person's doing. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I just like telling interesting stories. I think we have time for one more question. Hi. Hi. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I was wondering which, what ways do you connect with your character on The Looming Tower? And like, what was your way in? That's a really interesting question. Um, hmm. Uh, wow, you totally stumped me. Um, I feel like, sorry, I'm trying to figure out like what my way into answering this question is. Um, I feel like I can definitely identify with someone that is deeply devoted um, and serious about their job, um, like what that might feel like. Um, but also like how passionate she is about what she's doing um, and the fact that I think there's nothing else that she would rather be doing. Um, I think other, while I definitely have hobbies outside of a, being an actor, I don't think she does, and I feel like there's a degree to which I admire the fact um, that that's her purpose. Um, what are your hobbies? What are my hobbies? Oh, God. Um, I feel like I used to have a lot, and now, <laughs> now <laughs> so I have don't fewer. Have <laughs> They've just been falling away on the side of the road in life. Um, no, I, uh, I love walking around New York. Um, I feel like I kind of, when I was in Dublin, I... This is so ridiculous. I got a map of that city, and every time I'd walk down a street, I'd highlight it. And then I'd try and make sure that the next time I went home, I went a different way so I could see as much of the city as possible, which was a really good idea until you start to get into the seedier areas. And it's like, it's 5 o'clock, and that dude's drunk. I'm pretty sure something's going down over there on that side of the street. Maybe I should walk the other way. Um, so I love walking around New York. Um, I was actually just in Va just in Vancouver for a job. Um, loved walking around that city too. Um, and what else? I love taking photographs. Um, so anytime I have a chance to do that, I really enjoy that. I love traveling. I love watching TV and film um, and going to see plays. Obviously, I kind of like to knit. Um, I haven't I'm done that, for that in a one while. For some reason. I, I like to knit. I got into that when I was in college. Um, oh, what else? Meryl I love Streep to eat. Meryl Streep apparently knits, she, oh, from what cool. I understand. I, no, I don't mean love like to that, be put in the same sentence as Meryl Streep, I heard someone even if once, it's knitting. <laughs> someone once, like a, an AD from one of her movies once told me that the coolest thing about her is that she literally sits on set and knits wow. a lot of times, and then they're like, oh, we're ready for you, and she's just like, okay. Oh, and like it gets yeah. into it right away. It's yeah, actually, that's a secret about Patrick Fugit. He does not knit on set, <laughs> but he'll be like the biggest cut up. I mean, just like beyond ridiculous. And then they'll call like rolling in action, and he's just like immediately into the scene. You're like, how do you do that? I mean, I'm not sitting around like, oh my god, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Um, don't but, talk. Yeah, don't speak to me. I'm focusing. Uh, but yeah, I, yeah, I like to knit. Yeah. yeah. Um, Rena, The Looming Tower is on Hulu right now. Yes. First three episodes are up. It's fantastic. Love your work. Thank you so much for being Thank here. You. Everybody, Thanks, big guys. round of applause. Thank French you. Carrot.